uh, workshops and it's it's really um, it's really fun. Uh, even online on Zoom, there are things that you can do, believe me. Um, I would, I'd rather meet everybody in person and be able to be in the same room, but you know, there's this thing, I don't know if you've heard about, it, it's called coronavirus. It's, it's this thing that, um, you know, it's stopped the world or something like that. Um, so yeah, I want to ask you guys a question. Uh, why, why Shakespeare? Why do you think that 400 years later, actors and people go to the theater and see plays that have been done over and over and over again? What do you think? Anyone have any idea why, why we do Shakespeare? Why, why are you interested in doing Shakespeare? Anyone can answer. I think uh, when I think of some productions that I saw, there is energy that is really rare to find in another place. The energy of, of, of what? The language? The story? No, of the, um, of the stage, of the, the intensity of, of, of the story. All right, cool. Uh, Energy is a very useful word. I use energy a lot when I teach Shakespeare. Um, Anastasia, did you, were you going to say something? Um, it's history. It's interesting. <laughs> oh, so you, you appreciate the history of it. Uh, well, hopefully after this, um, you will appreciate the historical element of it, but also you'll appreciate how it is very modern. Um, anyone else? Anna or Vedana, can, would you like to give your thoughts on why you think Shakespeare is important to learn or why you want to learn Shakespeare? Uh, what about uh, me? I am a student of fact in the faculty mm -hmm. and uh, I am interested about this uh, about this uh, what? My English is very uh, okay. bad and I uh, Oh, sorry. My my uh, Ukrainian and Russian is very bad, so don't worry. But <laughs> I've, you know, uh, Shakespeare is to English what um, this guy is to Russian or Ukrainian. Yeah, Chekhov. Yeah. So uh, people love Chekhov because he was a great playwright and he wrote great characters mm -hmm. and he wrote in such in a in a beautiful way. Uh, so that's that's the same thing with Shakespeare. Um, Vedana, did you have, were you going to say something? I'm not sure if you were. Um, hello, uh, I don't know about Shakespeare. He's very famous, he's very, he's genius. Oh yeah, definitely genius. Uh, are you interested in acting? Are you an actor? Uh, yeah. All right, cool. Um, so let's, uh, we're running out of time. We only have an hour and a half, which is, not enough time. I, I've spent 20 years studying Shakespeare, but we're going to try mm -hmm. to see what we can do in an hour and a half. And we're going to focus on uh, Shakespeare's imagery. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so I just want to reiterate to re to the, these numbers might be important later on. So Ulfur, you're number one. Anastasia, you're number two. Anna, uh, you're number three. Uh, Vidana, you are number four. So just remember those numbers because they, they'll, they'll come up later on. So let's start off here. Uh, okay, here we... All right. Here we go. Can everyone see the screen? Yeah, see. The, yeah. The PowerPoint. All right, great. So, um, so this is again pro English theater, acting Shakespeare, working with imagery. Um, when I talk about acting Shakespeare, I, I've I, I think of um, a triangle of three things that you have to focus on. Uh, today we're only going to explore one of them. Uh, so. This is the, the, my Shakespearean triangle. So what do we focus on? I focus sometimes on the rhythm. 
uh, because it's written in a poetic uh, way that there's a meter and there's a rhythm. Also, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask at any time, that's okay. Uh, and if I'm talking too fast, again, let me know if I'm talking too fast. Uh, and then the second part of the triangle is the rhetoric and rhetoric is a big part of Shakespeare. We'll go over what these are in a second. And then we have imagery here, which is what we're focusing on today. So these are the three elements that um, a good actor will use when they're approaching uh, performing uh, Shakespeare. Uh, and it's very important to know that uh, Shakespeare is meant to be performed. It's it's not meant to be read quietly in your home. Shakespeare never published uh, his plays himself. He never went out and published his plays. He wrote for the theater. So think of Shakespeare's texts like, almost like musical, like sheet music for music. You wouldn't go out and buy, um, you know, Tchaikovsky 1812 Overture just to sit there and look and read it. You go and listen to the 1812 Overture by Tchaikovsky, right? So Shakespeare, I, I find reading Shakespeare boring, but watching, hearing, performing Shakespeare, the best. So we're gonna start off a little bit about rhythm. So rhythm is I, iambic pent, oh, sorry, did you have a question? No? So rhythm, uh, when we talk about rhythm in Shakespeare, we talk about iambic pentameter. So this is a line um, from uh, Twelfth Night. It's actually the first line in the play of Twelfth Night. Uh, if music be the food of love, play on. So this is a line of poetry. Iambic means it's an uh, unstressed syllable with a stressed syllable. Pentameter means there's five feet. One, two, three, four, five. A foot is two stresses. So if music be the food of love, play on. So that's what rhythm is. Now I'm overemphasizing the rhythm. You wouldn't actually perform it that way. Uh, um, but the rhythm in Shakespeare is there to tell you what words are important. And the audience feels this rhythm subconsciously and Shakespeare changes this ry rhythm when he wants to make something more dramatic. So we won't get too much into rhythm today because we're talking about imagery. So that's what I mean when I say rhythm. Well, what do, I, what do I mean when I talk about rhetoric? Rhetoric basically is um, argument, um, a persuasive talk or speech. So with rhetoric, you have like, what is the argument? What is the character saying? What, what are they trying to get? And they use things like antithesis, alliteration, parallel, all these big complicated Latin words that you don't need to know about now. Uh, but that's what rhetoric is. It's It's the the nuts and bolts of how to form an argument. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so that's rhetoric. And that's, that's the really, really nerdy like Shakespeare stuff. Um, but it is part of discovering Shakespeare. Now we're getting to today's topic, imagery. What do I mean when I say, when I say imagery? Like it's a very general and vague term. To me, imagery is, it's the use of pictures or figures of speech or descriptions to evoke action, ideas, objects, or characters. So that, to me, it's, it's when you use language that makes you think of, of something um, that provokes a powerful image or a, pro provokes an action or an idea or provokes a character. I think these mental images in Shakespeare usually uh, or something that appeal to the senses or something that the senses perceive. Really good Shakespeare or really good poetry, it's not just about hearing. It's, it's a really good poem will make you smell the flowers that are being described. They'll make you hear the wind that they're describing or um, feel um, the tactile nature of uh, maybe the scale of a lizard or something like that. And Imagery can be broken down into this. And what do I mean when I say the senses, the senses perceive, most people say there's five senses, but I am going to say that for this, there are seven senses. Mm -hmm. So the first, the five are the basic ones we all know, visual, auditory or hearing, olfactory or smelling, 
uh, taste and touch. That's the five senses. But I break down the last one, touch, into two more, organic, which is the awareness of a heartbeat or a pulse or breathing. This happens a lot in Shakespeare. In um, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Juliet's waiting for Romeo to come uh, see her and she says, gallop apace, you fiery footed feeds towards Phoebus lodging such a Wagner that would whip the wind. And the way that the poetry is inherent in that actually makes you feel a beat, a rhythm of like a heart and it's, it's kinesthetic. It, it makes you feel these things. Uh, and then there's like kinesthetic, uh, also like awareness of position or the movement in the body. So when I talk about image and acting imagery, I'm talking about things that the senses can perceive. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So um, getting to uh, that. So we all have our numbers here. Uh, so uh, the Odd numbers, people who have an odd number, so that would be Ulfer, um, Anna, Ulfer and Anna. Uh, you're going to do this exercise, and then and Anastasia and uh, Vedana will mm -hmm. do the next one. So what I want um, Anna and Ulfer to do right now is to look at this picture. It's a rose. Like, look at this rose and think about what a rose means to you. What does this rose mean to you? Take a moment and um, uh, you, you, can, you can even turn your mics off if you want to uh, explore or you can leave them on, it's up to you. But what I want you to do is look at this rose, picture that image in your mind, close your eyes and see that picture in your head. Once you see it in your, in your head with your eyes closed, I want you to allow that image in your mind to allow you to say the word rose being influenced by that image. So in your own time, just say the word. Rose. Okay, very good. Um, and Anna, can you can you say with your eyes closed, say what that image says to you? Mm -hmm. Anna, you there? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so can you, with your eyes closed, just allow yourself to say rose with this picture? Okay. Rose. Okay. So now open your eyes and look at that picture. Now allow yourself to discover what the difference is between imagining the flower and saying the word rose, does anything change? Do you, do you feel it in your, does, does it feel different in your mouth than it does in your mind? Um, take a second and allow this image, if it affects you in an, in an emotional way, that's great, that's fine, allow that to happen. So once again, um, looking at the flower this time, not with your eyes closed, say the word one more time when you're ready. Rose. Mm -hmm. Anna, can you uh, share with us your rose? Um. I don't know. You, you you don't understand what I'm asking? Um, maybe, maybe some else. Maybe, sorry? Um, 
maybe I uh, don't understand uh, what I do, must do. Okay, so I, what I want you to do is to look at this picture and allow this picture of this rose um, to give you the, to, to, I want you to say the word rose the way that this picture, this image looks or sounds like to you. You know what, we're going to move along because you might understand when I go to this next picture. So you guys, so we, this is a rose. Now I'm going to show you a picture of a different rose. Rose, same word, completely different image. So when you look at a rose like this, what does that image do to you? Does it make you feel happy? Does it make you feel sad? The last image, could you smell the last image more and this one less, or can you smell this more? It's, it's up to you. It's very individual. Uh, so have, so Ofer, um, look at this picture and allow, allow it to, um, to burn into your, into your mind. There's supposed to be a picture on the screen. You don't see the picture? I still see the first uh, slide. Really? Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh, okay, just one second. Can you see it now? No. What, what do you see? First uh, slide for English theater action picture. Oh, really? Is it scrolling through for you? Huh. Now, why did that happen? Sorry, guys, just give me one second. What do you see now? Do you see the senses? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, do you see the new rows? Yeah. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that, guys. Mm -hmm. So now we have a different rose. Mm -hmm. It's the same word, but it's a different image. So this is, this hopefully will sound different when you say it because it's a different image. So I want you to think about this rose. Think about how it makes you feel emotionally. So this is for um, Ofer and Anna again. Mm -hmm. So look, look at this rose. Picture it, like look at the image and then take a second, close your eyes, allow mm -hmm. yourself to see this different image of this different rose, and then just breathe and allow yourself to say it, say the word rose again, but allow this image, we want it to sound different because this is a different image, right? Mm -hmm. This is a different, a different feeling, a different emotion, okay? Mm -hmm. so when you're ready, uh, Ofer, go ahead and say rose. rose. All right, try, try, try it again. Allow, allow, let's, let's get more of that frost and more of that cold, uh, in, in your, in your voice. What happens when you have more of an emotional response to this rose? rose. Uh, okay. Uh, Anna, now, Different rows. How would you say rows with this image? Rows. Rows. Okay. So the reason why I'm showing these two pictures is because sometimes uh, Shakespeare uses, um, he uses so many words, right? Mm -hmm. um, every time you see a word in Shakespeare, uh, that creates image in your mind or in the audience's mind. The actor needs to be very clear as to what that image is, and it helps the audience feel that image as well through the senses. So the first picture, um, we have a nice, bright, colorful red rose, right? Can you see the, the red rose? The second picture, it's frostbitten, it's cold, it's 
it's it's not as optimistic it's more pessimistic so like for me if i look at this and i i see this rose it's happy so how do how you know how does that translate to me i would say rose 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 i flip to this one and i see this one and it's sad it's a rose that's might not be enjoyed by someone and i allow that image to affect my emotion and and it's not as optimistic as the last image it's rose 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 rose, rose. you feel the the how i it, the it's the same word two different images and i allow it to affect me in a way that's different so the people who are the um even numbers uh anastasia and vedana this one's for you guys so this next picture the this one's going abstract shakespeare uses a lot of abstract images so this is time so um we have time here so have a look at this time is is abstract you can't touch it you can't feel it but this is an image of time shakespeare uses time as an image or as in his poetry over and over and over again so uh, anastasia and uh, uh vedana as you look at this allow this version of time look at the hourglass what does this mean to you take a second close your eyes see the image allow is is time positive for you is it negative for you is it um does it make you happy does it make you sad uh, allow allow your own version of time explore that in your own imagination and after you've thought about it with your eyes closed allow yourself to say the word time 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 all right so time. you can say it a couple times yeah. try playing try playing with how long you say it how short you say it uh pitch up pitch down See, it, just explore it right now time 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 uh, to whoever is typing right now, do you mind um, turning your microphone off? Okay, so that's one one version of time. Uh, so this is a second image of time. So again, time, different image. Mm. Allow that to influence how you say the word time. So again, this is uh, Anastasia and Vedana. time 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 yeah yeah see time. you you feel yeah there's a definite time, difference time 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 yeah. time 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 and when you when you see this image i'm hearing you guys say it fast time 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 which reminds me of tick tock tick tock tick tock tick tock tick tock tick tock right same word exact same word two drastically different images two drastically different performances you know so when we explore Shakespeare's imagery, um, when, you, um, can, when you start to work on a new Shakespeare monologue or Shakespeare play, uh, when you look at all the iambic pentameter, you look at the, um, the rhetoric, but when you're looking at the imagery, you pick those images that Shakespeare gives to you. He gives, the, he gives us these beautiful images. And when you're exploring the imagery in Shakespeare's text, you kind of have to do the same thing. You have to, you have to imagine the word. What's your version of the word? What's your image of the word that you want the audience to hear? Um, it's in, in Shakespeare, so much is done with the imagery. That, that's why it's so beautiful. Uh, the poetry is so beautiful. So now that we've done these images, now I'm going to move to um, just a word. 
So this one, this one's for everyone. Everyone look at this word and everyone uh, close your eyes and think of your version of fire. Everyone just take a second, close their eyes, think about their version of fire. Is their version of fire a campfire? Is it a match, a single match lit? Is it a house on fire? Is it the sun? Is it, um, is it dangerous? Is it comfort? Is it, um, uh, is it helping you cook things? Is it scary? Is it painful? Everyone has their own response to this image. Try to find your own. What is in your mind? And go with your first gut instinct. Don't think about it too much. When you close your eyes and you think of the word fire, what fire. do you see? And now allow yourself to say the word. Allow yourself to say the word. Fire. Fire. Play with uh, stretching out how long it takes to say it, how short it takes to say it. Like, play with the language. Like, is there a difference when you go fire, 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 fire? Go ahead and, 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 and play with it. Fire. Fire. What happens when, you, when you're saying this word? Now, this is something that Shakespeare does a lot. Like if you use what we call alliteration, the consonant sounds in words, what happens if you really hit the F in fire? Fire and hit the R in fire. fire. What happens fire. when you do what they call assonance, which is the vowel, fire. Play, play, it doesn't have to sound realistic. Play with the word. Fire. 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 Does playing, Fire. playing with the consonant help you with your image or does your image and the consonant not work? So Fire. let's take a break for a second. Everyone can open their eyes um, and let's just share your thoughts. So with this word fire, um, how many people, um, how many people thought fire as a positive thing? I mean, it's positive. Yeah. Did, did anyone think of fire in a negative way? I think. You think it's in a negative way. So, um, if I want to hear one person, so, um, Ulfur, you, you said positive, right? And who mm -hmm. said negative? I. Anastasia. So close your eyes. I want to hear the difference between a positive fire and a negative fire. Okay. Uh, positive. Go ahead. Fire. Do you, you guys hear the difference? Like, uh, Ulfur's fire was very calming, very soothing. I, I was seeing like, coming in from the winter, there's a nice fire you can warm up to. And then Anastasia's was more biting and more like ferocious to me. Can you hear the difference? Everyone? Yeah. So yeah. this is what this is what we have to think about when we're dealing with imagery in Shakespeare. Just because the word is there and the word is a very profound image, you have to be very specific as to what that image means to you. What sense does that um, uh, evoke or, or uh, light up or inspire in your body? Um, so let's just go to actual Shakespearean texts now. So this here is a passage from Anthony, Anthony and Cleopatra. Uh, and this is uh, Inobaris describing Cleopatra's boat to some guys in Rome. So this is him describing to these Romans who have never been to Egypt, Cleopatra's beautiful boat. So have a look at it. If there's any words you don't uh, understand, uh, ask me and I can tell you what they mean. Uh, 
Uh, so there's a couple that I think sometimes burnished. Does everyone know what burnished means? So burnished means like polished, a well-polished throne. Uh, a barge is a, a kind of boat. Uh, so the barge, she sat it, the barge, oops. The barge she sat in like a burnished throne, burned on the water. The poop, the poop is um, the, the top deck on a boat. Not not number two, uh, you know. Uh, so the poop's the top deck. The, uh, the poop was beaten gold. So the whole top of the boat was covered in gold. Purple, the sails. And so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. So this is a barge that Cleopatra's sailing down, down the Nile. Uh, she, it, it looks like a polished throne and it burns on the water because the sunlight is hitting it and it looks like fire which is quite a sight and the top of it is is beaten gold uh the sails when he describes the sails as being purple this is very interesting like this to us right now in 2020 you might be like yeah so what the sails are purple but we have to take into historical context that purple dye was very expensive 400 years ago. So most most sails were just like white, off-white color because that was the cheapest thing. But to have giant sails dyed purple is really extravagant. So these sails are pur purple and they're so perfumed, they smell so good that the winds were lovesick with them. A lot of imagery, right? Tons of imagery. We have, like, what kind of imagery do we have in there? Can anyone spot um, different sense imagery? Do we have visual imagery in this? Burnishes tactile. Burnish is very tactile. That's true. It's, it's you can feel mm -hmm. polished, right? Um, so we have uh, tactile. So um, touch. Um, what else do we have? Can we anyone find any other Im 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 any senses? Perfumed, smells. Perfumed so sense, olfactory, yeah. smelling. What else do we have? Uh, winds, winds. Wind. So, what do you for you? What is wind? What kind of what sense do you think that? It's like time or like some feeling, like three. Yeah. So uh, the winds can be either like time or, or feeling or sound, mm. the sound of the wind hitting the sail, you know, that sound is un, un you, you can't mistaken that sound. So the wind can be sound. The wind can even be smell again, because you smell the perfume coming in on the wind, right? Um, so we have sound, we have touch, we have visual, we have like, even when I hear burned on the water i even hear water kind of splashing hitting hitting the boat just as it goes down the river so with this in mind think about in everyone pick so in in shakespeare we have in this we have one two three four lines of shakespeare so take a couple seconds look at this uh uh passage pick one image that you really like from each line so the first one you know whether you want it, it, the barge or burnished or thrown or do you want burned so each each line pick one image for each line and i'm going to get you all to um say this passage and i'm going we're going to try to see if we can figure out which image you guys were trying to explore the most. Does that make sense? So take a, take a couple minutes, turn, you can turn your microphones off and practice saying this. Not only are you, not only are you reading this and using your imagination, what happens to you physically when you say the words? Don't forget to play with the words as you explore the image. So like burnished, 
has like a, a hard B sound at the beginning, do you hit that B or not? Um, so if you can all just take your, turn your microphones off for a couple minutes and just explore saying this passage. So everyone, if everyone can turn their microphones off, please. Hello, if you can turn your microphone off. Yeah. Hi, can you turn your microphone off for a minute? We're, we're just reading this out loud, but I'm giving everyone a chance to turn the microphone off. Microphone off? Uh, yes, please. So allow yourself to say this over a couple times and certain words and certain images you're going to like more. Allow yourself to like certain images more. Certain words and certain images are going to feel more satisfying to say in your mouth. Allow that to happen. Shakespeare, in Shakespeare's time, people um, they weren't as visual a society as we are today. Today we watch movies, we see art, we play video games. Shakespeare's time, he didn't have any of that. So people listened more and people played with language more. Allow yourself to play with this language. It doesn't have to sound realistic. We can make things more realistic later. This is about exploring language and image. So I'll give you... Um, a couple more minutes, uh, or one more minute, uh, and really play with some of the consonant sounds. The barge, she sat in like a burnished, you know, hit those Bs maybe. Um, for the consonants, stretch some of the words, try to say some of the words shorter. Um, also, as you're describing this and saying this, this is something to think of. Does the speaker, you, think that this is a, a beautiful boat or an ostentatious boat? Like ostentatious means too gaudy. It's like, ah, oh, it's too much. Allow yourself to, to build into a, a character. Does this person think this boat is beautiful or it's just like, it's a bit too much? Uh, because this is the question the actor who's playing this character has to ask themselves. Try to think, is there any way you can paint this image with your voice to even make the combination of words sound like something floating on the Nile? The barge she sat in like a burn is thrown, burn on the water. Like, play with it that way uh, for now and, we, and see if you'd explore and find anything new. All right, so let's, uh, let's hear what people have discovered. Um, if everyone can turn their um, microphones back on. Uh, and as it, sorry, the, is it Julia? Julia, did you, is that your name? Julia? Uh, uh, Julia? Yes. Okay. See, I, I'm just learning how to read Cyrillic, so I was making sure. Um, your number is going to be uh, five. 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 So you're going to go fifth. Three. Fiat. Um, so everyone remember the numbers? Yeah. All right. So yes. go in order. So. Uh, just read it, take your time. Don't worry about performing, worry about exploring and playing with the language. So we'll go in the order that I, I gave you. So um, Ofer, if you'd like to start, just read this out. The barge, 
to satin like a burnished bone turned on the water. The cup with satin gold, purple the sail, Power. and all the fumes blend for love to be done. Okay, Four. number two. Five. The barge is satin like a burnished throne. Burn on the water, the poop was beaten gold. Pearls the sails and so perfumed it, the millions were lovesick with them. Okay. Anna? The barge, she sat in like a burnished throne. Born on the water, uh, the poop uh, was bitter gold. Purple the sail and the so perfect that uh, the winds we are loving, lovesick uh, with them. Mm -hmm. Next. The barge, the barge is set in like a burnished throne. Burned on the water, the poop was beaten gold. Purple the sails and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. All right. And uh, Julia? Julia, would you mind? Would you want to read it? Hello? Uh uh, the bar, uh, the bar she sat in like a bashing net throwing, bashing on the water. The pool was beaten gold. People, sh the sails, and so performing that. The ones we uh, love sing with them. All right, very good. Um, so, does anyone have any thoughts about what they've heard? What, what do, what do you? What do you notice when you say it or when other people say it? Say it. So what images do you hear most? What, what is, um, what is the most, if, if you were to describe this scene to me, what's the image that's the most prevalent that you see the most? For me, water. Water, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, water. Anyone else? What else do you see? Anyone else? Some barge. So you, so you know. see a barge, yeah? For me, uh, it's those pur pur the purple sails. Uh, this whole thing, I, it's, I just, I'm picturing these giant purple sails like on the Nile and how bright that would be uh, shining off the water. Um, so like when we're exploring all these big images, uh, like when we were doing with the pictures of the rose and with time, you kind of have to be very specific and, and trust that if you never want to be general with Shakespeare, you know, you never want it to be a purple sail. You want it to be purple, the sails, like the sails were purple. And each word, each, each, uh, word in the phrase in the sentence is so important like take for example in the third line here that I love purple the sail and so perfumed that like purple the sails and so perfumed so smelly like so the actor sees that so and that helps with the image if I say purple the sails and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with him. You don't get as much as you do if I say purple the sail and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. So finding those little words to help with the image, that's uh, something that we explore in the full workshop with iambic pentameter. But let's move along to a longer passage of uh, Shakespeare here. So this here is from um, Measure for Measure. 
It's a, it's, mm, I guess, an obscure play. So this is a scene where there's a, a man and he's in jail. He's in jail because um, he, uh, he, this is, you know, 400 years ago in, in a, a different time. And he had, he had uh, sexual relations with his girlfriend before they were married. So he's in jail for that. Um, he asked his sister, um, who's training to be a nun, to go ask the Duke to help him out. But she comes back to him in jail and says that, you know, she can help him, but she has to sleep with the Duke. Uh, but because she's, a, she's going to be a nun, she can't do that. And she says, prepare yourself to die. And he goes, okay, uh, I'll, I'll die. But then he changes his mind and he's scared. And he describes what, um, what death might be like to him. So in this passage, um, we have a lot of interesting imagery. So uh, why don't we go each person, so we get, what do we have? Five people here. So one, two, three, four, five. So each person will read a line. So Ulfur, who's number one, you'll read the first line, then two, three, four, five, and then at, at the at in thrilling region of thick ribbed ice, we'll go back to the beginning again. So each person will read a couple lines. Does that make sense? What is Claude, for example? Oh, uh, so what I'll do is I can actually, I'll give you the definition of things just right here. So here's, um, uh, I quickly did up what uh, some of those words are. So I means yes. Obstruction in this case means to stop or to stop living. Uh, motion means body. Clod is like a lump of earth or clay. Uh, to reside is to live. Pendant world is like a hanging world, like picture, like something hanging on a string. Uh, uh, howling, I guess you'd understand that. Weariest is like most tired. Loathed is hated. Uh, penury is poverty. And I think the rest of those are self-explanatory. Um, for now, don't worry too much about the words that you don't understand. Just read them and we can um, work on the nuance of that later. Uh, so, uh, so the first line will be Ofer, the second line will be Anastasia, then Anna will have the third line, uh, Vedana will have the fourth line, and Julia will have the fifth line, and then we'll go back to the top, okay? Okay. All right, go ahead. I, but to die and go, we know not well. To lie in cold obstruction and to rot. This uh, sensible warm mansion to become? Needed cloud and their delighted spirit. Julia, are you there? Yeah. Are you are you there? Yeah. So are you, are you following along? Yeah. So um one, two, three, four. So you're going to read this line here, to bathe in fire. To, ba to bathe in fire float or to rise. Arise it, Ilika. Or to reside. Or to reside. Okay, now in we're going to go, we're each going to get a line. So Ulfur is going to take the next line again. In three ring? No, sorry, Julia. Um, we're... Each person gets a line, so we're going to, Ulfur is going to start this next line. To be imprisoned in the viewless winds. Viewless winds. Viewless winds. Mm -hmm. And blown with uh, restless violence round about. The bandit world, worse and worst. All right. 
Julia, are you there? Mm. Oh, so that lawless and in 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 certain yep. um, throat. Imagine how. Oh, so you're just going to do one line each. So now it's going to go back to um, Ofer. Okay. The rarest and most lived worldly life. Is it H? Uh, uh, H? Ache. Ache. Um, penury and uh, imp uh, imprisonment. Yeah. Leonator is a paradise. And Julia? To what we, uh, to what we fear, our uh, death. All right, good. So, um, if you can, kind of remember which lines you read, those are going to be your lines. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to read it uh, quickly through, just so you know um, how to pronounce um, the words. Don't worry about your accent, but I'm going to read it um, just so you know how the word might be pronounced. So I. But to die and go we know not where, to lie in cold obstruction and to rot, this sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod and the delighted spirit to bathe in fiery floods or to reside in thrilling regions of thick ribbed ice, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round about the pendant world, or to be worse than worst, of those that lawless and in certain thought imagine howling, tis too horrible, the weariest and most loathed worldly life, that age, ache, penury, and imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death. All right, so, what kind of imagery do we get coming out of this uh, monologue? Is it happy? <laughs> what do you guys think? <laughs> it's not. It, yeah, it's it's not a very um, optimistic uh, image of what happens to us. It's not about heaven or pearly gates and clouds with little uh, angels with little bow. It's definitely he's scared, right? So he's using imagery to to um to make his point to get what he wants and so let's have a look at this let's take this line by line uh, one more time we'll go really really slow so Ofer, if you you can just start us off with that first line I, but to die and go the moment well. so there's not too much imagery in this line uh, seemingly there's not too much imagery but the whole thing is this here to go where we know not where that can that can be an image don't you think yeah yeah so that's yeah uncertainty or emptiness those are those are things that are powerful images that um, is exactly what Claudio this character is saying uh, so let's move on to the second line there. To lie in cold obstruction and to rot. All right. So what do we have there? What kind of imagery do you think? Just, you don't like uh, when people talk not true. And for these people, it's like uh, something, something dirty, you know. So... So what do you think, what do you think are the, the, the biggest, what's the biggest image this line says to you? Uh, it's like cold and rot. Yeah. So to lie in, it, to, not just to lie in obstruction, but to lie in cold obstruction and to rot. So I, you know, for, for me, that cold obstruction and rotting very key images uh so the next line 
this uh, sensible warm motion to become. So this sensible warm motion to become. So, so this sensible warm motion. So that basically means this moving, feeling body, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's interesting that Shakespeare starts with cold obstruction and to rot. And the next image is the antithesis of this, the opposite. So he talks about cold, then all of a sudden he talks about warm. So he's, he's reminding the listener that I don't want to lie in cold obstruction and to rot. This is a sensible feeling warm body. So think of motion as body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of imagery of, of warm and motion. So the first, so the second line, we have cold obstruction, rot, cold, not moving, dying. And the next line he gives us sensible feeling warm, moving the complete opposite. So those are powerful images. Uh, the fourth line. He needed clot and the delighted spirit. Okay. So what do we have there? What are the images you hear and feel there? Do you know what needed is? Do you know what? Spirit. Delighted spirit. But do you know what needed means? Needed. Mm. Yeah, like dough. Like when you're making dough and you're punching, you're making like, uh, uh, you know, dumplings or pizza you you needing you're pushing the dough so shakespeare says a kneaded clod and sometimes you know like a punch you're punching the dough so a kneaded clump of clay so we have that image with delighted spirit so we have these two images so this the sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod this thing that's in the earth and then the next image, sorry. Yeah. And then the next image we have here is a, is the delighted spirit. So needed clod, clod meaning earth, that's down, that's low. Delighted mm -hmm. spirit is something high. So we have imagery of low and high in this line, right? So let's do the, to bathe. Whose line was that? Yeah. One, two. Two, three, four. Five. Yeah, so Julia, if you can read your line, please, to bathe. To, um, to bathe in fire float or to reside. Okay, so what do we have here? We have to bathe. And what, what are we bathing in? What, what do you think a fiery flood is? Fire float. Yeah, what does that mean to you? Maybe is um, if we are talking about dying, and there's like heaven, purgatory, and hell. Where do you think fiery floods? Sun flood, and fine floods. Where would fiery floods be? Would they be in heaven, purgatory, or hell? Maybe is not Hell. What does so fiery to bathe is to take a bath in fiery floods so to me that's like a lake of fire and that's commonly what we people think of when they think about hell they think of fire in liquid fire everywhere right yeah so so that's a very powerful image not just you're you're soaking in fiery floods so we go from the delighted spirit this beautiful light, beautiful thing going down into fiery floods. So again, we have this up down image, right? We have hot and cold images, right? So a lot of this imagery is hot, cold, up, down. Uh, so much imagery in this. Let's go on to the next line. Um, I believe uh, who's, Ulfur, you're next? Experience. 
in thrilling region of thick ribbed or ribbed ice. So what, what, what does that sound like to you? Offer? Um, like a prison made with uh, ice. Oh, good, a prison, yeah, I like that image. Like a prison made with thick ribbed bars of ice. So this is a powerful image that Shakespeare puts, he starts with hot, fiery floods, or if that's not what happens when you die, you could be in a prison made of ice, freezing cold. Does that, is, does everyone see how that works? So the next line he says, uh, that's Anastasia, I think. Uh, to be imprisoned in the Viewless winds. Viewless winds. Okay, what, what do you feel? What's the imagery that pops out for you there? And something when you, the close uh, space, but you feel in, like winds, but you don't, you cannot, you cannot see this. Oh, yeah. It's just like, so for you that... Like a spirit. Mm, yeah, and, and that would be like torture for infinity, right? Like to, to be imprisoned in a small space. So this is your image of this, and I love it. You're imprisoned in a small space. You can't see anything, and there's all this wind coming at you, and constant, it never stops. Um, that's really uncomfortable. So, yeah, again, another powerful. And if this in this imagery we have uh, sound, sense, uh, sense the sound of the wind. Mm -hmm. We have um, the feeling of the wind. Is this cold wind? Is this hot wind? You know. All of the, that work we did before, you can bring into this. Uh, and let's go on to the next line. Uh, that would be Anna, I think. Mm -hmm. And blown uh, with restless violence around uh, about. Uh... So, okay, so and blown with restless violence round about. So what do you feel that line means? What's? Uh, it's... Um... Is blown. So, uh, so to, the image that we get before is to be imprisoned in uh, in the viewless winds, and you're blown around with restless. So, what does restless mean? Maybe wild. Wild, but restless means in this case like it never stops. Mm. It doesn't rest. It is restless. So you're blown around with restless violence. You're not, this is not you on a nice little hammock being blown like, ah, this is unstopping violence round about. Uh, the next line is, who's got that? Okay. Dependent world or to be worse than the worst. All right, so this one here, this or to be worse than worst, not too much imagery there, but the pendant world. Like, so I said pendant meant hanging. So what do you, um, Vedana, what do you think of when you think of that image? For you, what does it mean? A mm. hanging world. How can you help, how does that image help you act this line? It's uh, something without finish. Yeah. Something unfinished? Okay, yeah, I like that. Um, so something unfinished, maybe the, the pendant world. I picture the world hanging on a string in the middle of darkness and you're blown with restless violence round about this emptiness of space. That's me, that's what I see. But if you feel that something's unfinished, Stay, stay true to that and allow that image to help you with how you read it. Uh, and pen and world, or to be worse than worse. So to be worst of all, who's got the next line of those? Uh, that's Julia. Of uh, those so, so that laws and in encounter. In in certain. In certain sort. Of those that lawless 
and in certain thought. What do you think that means? Maybe it's was that worst. Yeah, so it is, this is to be worst of the worst is of those. So what do you think lawless means? Maybe it's pound and what? Say that one more time. Pound and what? Yeah. I, lawless to me is a person who breaks the law. So when you think of hell, that's where bad people go, right? Mm. Good people go to heaven. Uh, so of those that lawless, so people who break the law, and uncertain. Do you know what uncertain means? Uncertain. Okay. If someone says they are uncertain, what what do they mean? In certain, I don't know. Okay, so in certain means you're not sure. If someone says uh, says to me, uh, Scott, uh, what's five hundred and sixty five times four hundred and sixty three? I'd be like, I'm not. I'm uncertain about that. Right? It means I don't know. Uh, or I'm not certain. So certain, if you're certain about something, it means you know. Like if you ask me right now, Scott, what time is it? I'll say it's 8.14. And you'd say, are you certain? And I'd be like, yes, I'm certain. I'm looking at my clock. Oh, it's 8.15 now. And I'm certain that it's 8.15 because I'm looking at this. So someone who's uncertain isn't sure. So in, in this case, Shakespeare is talking about someone who break of uh, people who break the law or have uncertain thought, bad thoughts in this sense. Uh, and let's go back to Ofer, if you want to read that. Imagine howling. So howling. What's howling? Sorry. Screaming. Yeah. It's. Shakespeare could have said screaming, but he says howling. And, and, and in English, like howling almost has a connotation of an animal. Animals howl, wolves howl, um, wolves howl at the moon. Like to, to me, a howl is a different than a scream. A scream is one thing and a howl is something else. So, so this is, Claudio is talking about these people in hell who are screaming all the time, the, the people who break the law or have evil thoughts and they, that imagine howling and he says, tis too horrible. Like this sounds awful. And then he continues the next line. The very raised and most loathed worldly life. So what's, so if you remember what weariest is? Uh, no, I didn't. So if you're weary, you're very tired. I so tried. The, yeah, so the weariest is like, like if, if someone, if I come, Exhausted. Yeah, exhausted. So, so the weariest would be the most exhausted and the most loathed. Uh, Hate. Hated. Uh, so the weariest and most loathed worldly life. So what do you think he means there? Um, maybe he don't want uh, he won't die maybe now he like don't he don't know um, maybe he don't want uh, a future life mm, yeah I think in this he's talking about other people so he's saying he says the weariest and most loathed worldly life so basically he's saying the most exhausted and most hated people in this mm. world in this world, we'll go on to the next line here, that age. Mm, age. Mm -hmm. So who's who's got that line? Is it age, ache, uh, penury, and uh, imprisonment? All right. So that age. So what do you, what does he mean by age? Mm. Mm, I don't know. Mm. I think maybe old age, you know, like, so the, we're talking about weary people and hated people. And he follows with that age, ache. Do you know what ache means? Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. So like your, your muscles ache, they're sore. Penury, which I said was poverty or being poor. And imprisonment. So why does he mm -hmm. list all of those things? So he says the weariest and most loathed worldly life. So the, the most exhausted and the hate, most hated people in this world that are old, that have aches, that are poor and that are imprisoned. And then we go to this next line. Leon nature is a paradise. So basically, what, what do you think he's saying there, Vedana? Mm, he can lay on nature. It's like paradise. <laughs> yeah. So can you guys all see my cursor on the screen, my arrow? Yeah. yeah. So he says the most exhausted and the most hated people that are old, that have aches, that are poor and are imprisoned, they have in life a paradise. So basically he's saying people who are poor, people who have aches, people who are already in prison, people, these people live in paradise compared to, and the last line here, Julia, what's the last line there? Uh, to what we fear of death. To what we fear of death. To what we fear of death. Yeah. So in this last section, he's talking about um, the people who have it bad in life. The people who are tired, who are um, hated. Lying. Who are what? Lying. Sorry, I Lying. couldn't hear. Wong. 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 Long. Long? Yeah. What do you mean long? Um, so here, this, this, the last four lines, he's talking about how anyone who has a really shitty life is living in paradise compared to what we think or think of death. Basically, those last four lines, it's better to be in prison, to be old, to be sick, to be poor and alive than it is to be dead. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's, so now that we kind of understand uh, what this means, is, is there anything that anyone is unsure of right now? Does anyone have any questions about anything in this speech that they still don't understand? Nope. So, no. No. so look at the lines, take a couple seconds and look at the lines that uh, you read, the three different lines. Pick one image that's in that line. Some of these lines won't have as much imagery in them, but th you can find something like, I mean, to what we fear of death. I mean, there's, death is a pretty big image, um, you know, can lay on nature. Paradise is a interesting image. Find one image in each of your lines. Take a moment, close your eyes, uh, like say that word over, find what that image means to you. Is, uh, and also think about the context of this scene, of this monologue. This is a, a scared man who's trying to convince his sister to help him out. So how does that change things, yeah? So uh, I'm going to give you uh, a minute to, to look over these, um, these lines and, and explore with your imagination and uh, how it sounds when you say it out loud. So everyone can just turn their microphones off for a, couple, for a minute. If you have a question, feel free to ask. And as you're doing this, I encourage you to not do too much thinking, but actual 
exploring, actually saying the words out loud. You will discover more about this text by saying it than you will by thinking it. Remember to try speeding it up, slowing it down. Uh, in the in the line, you can speed up at some on some words, slow down on other words. How does it change the sense of the line? How does it change the image that this character is trying to convey? And I'll give you 30 more seconds and then we're going to see what you've discovered. Okay, if everyone can turn their microphones back on. Um, and we're just going to go through this again, and we're going to read this all the way through. And uh, just remember, you can even you can even take your time. It doesn't have to to make sense. We we this is more of an exploration than it is a performance. Okay. So, um, Alpha, if you're uh, ready to go. I have to die and go you know not well. To lie in cold obstruction and to rot. This uh, sample worm mentioned to become the needed cloth and the delighted spirit. Julia? <laughs> to base in fire flaws or to rise. To be imprisoned in the wireless winds and blown with restless violence round about the pendant the world or to be worse that worst who those that lose and in certain sold The rarest and most loaded worldly life that age, ache, penury, and uh, imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise. To what we fur all days. All right, that's pretty cool. Um, any thoughts or observations? What do you guys think? Let's hear from you. Did you, ex did you discover anything? Um, are you more confused about imagery now? Or what do you think? A little bit confused, what? I think, because, uh, because of, um, for example, of my line, I understand, but sometimes for when I listen in other lines and other people, sometimes I feel in something, sometimes mm -hmm. no. Yeah, I mean, this is all uh, an exploration. We're, we're, you guys are reading and seeing this for the first time. Even uh, a professional Shakespearean actor needs time and rehearsal to, to, to explore all of these things. And this is, um, why Shakespeare is so good because uh, 
you can perform it over and over again and always find new things that you want that it, that you want to bring to it uh that's why uh i mean that's why we have rehearsal right to practice to, to discover all this so these are things we would slowly pull out of this piece if we had more time to work on it and you know yes and, and some images are going to be more powerful than others you know that's just the nature of the text that's just the nature of uh your personality right anyone else any thoughts or questions sometimes i felt that some consonants are not uh, not that i don't know them but uh, uh, yeah, um, that's that's an important um, point um, because obviously English is all of your second languages, and yeah, there are some sounds that you know aren't you're not used to uh and it, it it's it's those consonant sounds can be played or um they can they, they can be ignored but better to maybe learn to learn those sounds because if all of this are like tools that you put in your shakespeare acting tool belt being able to find those consonant sounds is just another tool that helps you out. Um, so, uh, so which what what was the sound that you said was hard for you? Oh, big, but maybe you work more with vowels when you think about imagery and emotion. Um, it's it's both because you know. For big emotions, sometimes you want those loud, open, wide vowels like I, like to say I, it's like that's a big word, right? Like it's like he's like I, like it's a big, big interruption. He's like, yes, um, like I is more open of a vowel sound than yes. Yes, I, uh, like that's an open vowel sound in English, right? So it's true. But in the second line, cold obstruction and to rot those uh consonants are really juicy for that image to lie if okay i'm going to say it once without really hitting the consonants and then hitting it so the first time to lie in cold obstruction and to rot versus to lie in cold obstruction and to rot do you hear the difference you know, you can run the risk of going over the top with that, but it's it's a really good tool to help with the characterization and the image that's being put there, right? The word rot, if I say rot, if I say rot, right? Big difference, I think. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? No. What's the? Did did anyone learn anything new in in looking at this, or is this was this all boring? And you're like, ah. Yes, of course, a lot of new. So what? Okay, so what, what's what is uh, what did you what did you find interesting about this? And what what's um, okay? What's something that you're still confused about and what's something that you've maybe learnt two things everyone think of two things something that you're still confused about and something that you've learnt i think uh, about second uh, it's interesting because you imagination and you feel like what's mean like it's smell or it's touch it's so interesting uh about confused of course it's different language uh -huh. must, yeah it's not it cannot it could be clear for you just like need to time yeah to of course fill in these words. yeah so even people who speak english as their first language they find shakespeare hard because there are a lot of words that we don't use anymore in english yes so, he has different lang language old english yeah this is technically um early modern english but it's still 
there are still a lot of different words that we're like, what? You know, so we're, most people are in the same boat. Uh, anyone else, anything like confused or Yes, learned? for me, uh, confused is uh, language, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, something new is different senses. I can hear, sound, feeling. Yeah, and so you can, you can change the way that you uh, say the word to kind of invoke one sense more than the other. And, yeah. and you, that's in using your, using your imagination and using the way the word is. Like I said, cold, obstruction, and to rot, you know? Or I, but to die, you know, as opposed to I, but to die, you know? These are clues to the actor. Um, Shakespeare gives us a blueprint with his lines and the actor's job is to read the blueprint and it's all there in the text. Um, it's very, um, it, it's very good for actors to learn Shakespeare because then once you learn this, uh, I'm going to skip a forward here. Uh, so going back to this here, once you learn this, if you can do Shakespeare, you have to look at rhythm, you have to look at rhetoric, you have to look at imagery. And after exploring Shakespeare, when you, as an actor, if you go to contemporary text or contemporary plays or movies, you have so many tools in your acting tool belt that it makes it easier to approach modern um, text, to do a play by, you know, Eugene O'Neill, or even, well, now Chekhov is still difficult, but so, it's easier to know Shakespeare and then try to do contemporary modern plays than it is to do contemporary modern plays and try to learn Shakespeare. Can I, can you guys see that? Uh, the, uh, yes, Shakespeare like contemporary. Sorry? Um, but the questions, I didn't understand. Um, that if you learn Shakespeare, and yeah. how to perform Shakespeare, that it makes doing contemporary or modern texts or plays easier. Mm, I think yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, because there's, 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 you're like, even looking at this screen here, we have rhythm, rhetoric, imagery. Those are three, imagine three balls you're juggling while you're acting. You know, if you're doing modern text, you don't have to worry about rhythm. So you're only doing like, two balls maybe, you know. So it's, it's uh, learning Shakespeare is very helpful for actors, I think. Uh, and we are out of time, but if anyone has any questions or anything they wanna ask me or about Shakespeare, about acting, about anything, uh, I'm free for the next 10 minutes to, to talk about um, anything else you wanna talk about. Um, or if not, you can, uh, call it a day. Uh, but if you are interested, you know, uh, starting next week, we uh, will be doing uh, the workshop with, um, we'll be focusing on all three of these elements and, and try to marry them all together into um, working on scenes and monologues of Shakespeare. Any final thoughts? Mm -hmm. Whenever I learn uh, contemporary stuff, realistic mm -hmm. stuff, being rhythmically is one of the things that are not allowed. Ah, uh, yeah. Then you deal with words and not with your heart more. Yeah. And of course, it's beautiful in, in Shakespeare. Is it hard to be dramatic when you follow this imagery, rhythm, and rhetoric? You lose the dramatic sense for a while until you incorporate all together? Um, with the rhythm of Shakespeare, uh, at first the actors feel that it's, um, it's, it's not realistic. And it's not. People don't really talk like this. But in this world, um, there, there is a realism within that rhythm that's kind of hard to explain. Um, it, basically in Shakespeare, in performing Shakespeare, you, these characters are so heightened that, and they're so smart that they 
you just have to believe that these characters are smart enough to use all these beautiful terms and to, to think of them that quickly, right? Um, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's the world that Shakespeare's in, is you have to accept that. But that being said, because it's poetry, um, you know, it can sound very natural. If it's done right, it sounds very natural because iambic pentameter, the metrical rhythm that Shakespeare uses the most is the closest to the human heartbeat, a bump, a bump, a bump, a bump, a bump. And it's the closest rhythm um, to natural English speech. So it can sound very natural. Uh, any other thoughts, questions? No. Uh, of course, it's some very interesting like uh, subject about talking, but I have several odd questions. But I think for today, it's really interesting for me. It's like um, maybe like first step to understand uh, this uh, um, Shakespeare, this yeah. poetry. It's there's always the first step, and Shakespeare is so overwhelming the first time you start to learn about it it's there's so much you feel you have to learn and know even if english is your first language um and that's fine that's where i was when i first started learning shakespeare i was like what is this crazy stuff and over time you you develop you, you your appreciation only gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger yeah, thank you so much. No problem, no problem. Uh, so if anyone has any other questions, you can ask me, you can contact uh, the Pro English Drama School. Um, you can uh, uh, join us uh, next week uh, for the uh, course that we're going to do. I think it's eight sessions. And I hope everyone uh, has now has a deeper understanding and a deeper interest in watching and hearing Shakespeare. Uh, thanks for joining, guys. You were thanks, great. Todd. All right. Thanks. Uh, all right. Um, have have a good evening. Thanks. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Просто позже посмотрю ее, что еще то не то не могу не. Ох.